For these next sections, we'll be tackling the individual antidepressants because each of these has distinct properties that you'd make you'd end up selecting one over the other. It's a bit, I would say, compared to say you know cardiovascular drugs, it's a bit more apparent even within the same class, it, and it goes beyond just half life. For instance, so for escitalopram, for example, you know, as a part of the class of so-called selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, yes, all of these drugs block CERT, but escitalopram seems to be the only one that blocks CERT only, selectively. Um, so as compared to the other SSRIs, even you would expect that it would not carry as much of a stimulating factor as say with fluoxetine, right? Although, for some reason, among all the SSRIs, it is only escitalopram that significantly prolongs QT interval. You will see other references claim that it is a class thing, but you know, based on studies we've seen, it is only escitalopram and citalopram, but we don't have citalopram, so just think of the S isomer. It is only escitalopram among the SSRIs that significantly prolongs QT interval. Just be mindful of that. Plus some 2C19 interactions, but not nothing as major as fluoxetine, actually. One way I remember that is my mnemonic, so SCPROF na QT. Actually, that's a longer Tagalog mnemonic, actually. SCPROF na QT, ma pride sa first and second, halo-halo, nakakosoka, may amag, PI2. Yeah, um, that's for drugs that prolong QT interval. You can check it out in the cheat sheet for the longer version. But anyway, that's one way to remember escitalopram. Now, fluoxetine, there's a lot more to fluoxetine because besides blocking CERT, it also blocks the 5-HT2C serotonin receptor. And 5-HT2C in a, one part of the brain um, regulates the release of other neurotransmitters. So you block that, it can promote the release of, say, um, stimulating neurotransmitters like certain catecholamines, which can be well stimulating to the body. And so Generally, the recommendation is you should be giving this in the morning. Yeah. So it's very stimulating. For children, in fact, you might even see an activating effect. So an activating effect like irritability, restlessness, which is distinctive from a manic switch in that, you know, a manic switch will come with a lot of impulsivity, grandiosity, etc. And as, as long as you're familiar with how manic switch works, you can differentiate the two. Okay. So the activation is just... Uh, due to the stimulating effect that it's a bit more, it hits harder in kids, basically. Um, what else? It also weakly blocks the norepinephrine transporter. So dug, dug by, uh, that's an addition to its stimulating properties. So speaking of kids, despite this, several meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials have shown consistently that it is fluoxetine that remains the only efficacious antidepressant in children within the younger, younger age groups. It is still the first line antidepressant in children when therapy does not work out. So a lot of emphasis on kids here. Although be mindful, besides being stimulating in its pharmacodynamics, it's also a bit feisty in its kinetics. Lots of interactions. Don't forget those. Okay, so I don't know. I just kind of built on the I did some play on words with flocks. So flocks of hyper children because a lot of emphasis on kids here being bullied on the internet. I say bullied because bulimia. It is a one, it is the most studied antidepressant actually for bulimia, um, along with clonipramine, but again, fluoxetine is safer. So fluoxetine on the net, so because it's a net blocker, and there was supposed to be a video from Tom Scott's As Duff movie. Now, for sertraline, for the longest time, you know, I was saying that, you know, sertraline isn't really anything special besides the false positive stuff with drugs, but now that's not unique to sertraline. LSD can be a false positive result with fluoxetine as well. One good thing for ones that make sertraline stand out is the cardiac. So among all the SSRIs, sertraline is the most studied for service users with depression and comorbid coronary artery disease. This may be due to its antiplatelet properties. So similar to aspirin, not mean not really its main thing, but you know, in that same vein of reason, sertraline may be efficacious. Um, in fact, some clinical trials and continuation studies suggest that surgery may even reduce the incidence of myocardial infarction of heart attacks in those with depression and comorbid coronary artery disease. So at worst, it will not make things worse. Although, again, be mindful of the bleeding risk because these people are often taking multiple anticoagulant antiplatelets. So 
be mindful of the interactions, but at best, there may be a reduction in myocardial infarction. So as long as you're mindful of the interactions, some potential benefit there. Plus again, it's stimulating because of dopamine transporter blockade. So besides blocking CERT, it also blocks slightly blocks dopamine reuptake. So some dopamine can be a bit stimulating. Kaya with sertraline, especially you know, take it in the morning. All right. So that's my memory aid. I asked permission from Sir Sir. You can check out his channel at SLCM Chem on YouTube. Um, makes good org chem biochem videos. And paroxetine, you know, not really one of my favorites. I because again, besides CERT, the other two receptors it blocks us, it really don't really confer any additional benefits. In fact, you see more side effects with this. The M1 muscarinic acetylcholine receptor antagonism is the anticholinergic. So anticholinergic meaning either opposite of dumbbells, right? Or you can do the Alice in Wonderland stuff, whichever works better for you. And then NOS, nitric oxide synthase. Nitric oxide, vasodilation, important for sexual function. Right? So you block its synthesis, more sexual dysfunction, actually. Plus, 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 it has a very short half-life. So in terms of withdrawal risk, paroxetine has one of the higher withdrawal risks. So much so that because children are actually more sensitive to withdrawal symptoms, side effects, do not give paroxetine in kids. Do not. Just do not. It's not. This is not an official contraindication, but... Meta-analyses in children have recommended just do not give these in children because there is a hypothesis that it's possible that withdrawal may precipitate suicidal ideation and behavior. And this may be more pronounced in younger populations. So just don't give paroxetine in kids. Just don't. Okay? Fluoxetine, on the other hand, has a longer half-life. So that might potentially, potentially be one reason why it is more preferable in children. Potentially. Right? What else? Fluvoxamine, there's a lot I want to say about this. Among all of the repurposed drugs for COVID, I would say this and inhaled corticosteroids had the most potential, although the evidence for inhaled corticosteroids might not justify its risks, so it didn't receive a favorable recommendation from guidelines despite the two clinical trials. And fluvoxamine, well, I will just refer you to the primary literature, the Stop COVID Clinical Trial, Together and PISMIDS, evaluation of the evidence. Basically, in short, the outcomes they used in the TOGETHER trial were too ambiguous to draw a firm conclusion on whether fluvoxamine worked for outpatient COVID. This was mainly, the main theories are because fluvoxamine also works as a sigma-1 um, agonist that might have effects in reducing the inflammatory response due to COVID and as well as its other, other mechanisms like CERT blockades effect on um, platelets, coagulation, and immune response in the lungs, etc., etc. But anyway, all theories until we get definitive evidence. I'll just refer you to those primary studies. But to be mindful that uh, this is an underrecognized interacting drug. We all, I often talk about fluvoxetine, but fluvoxamine really likes to mess with other drugs, particularly 1A2. So 1A2 was a big concern for the D25HT antagonist, the anti so-called antipsychotics like clozapine, olanzapine, as well as other drugs that are substrates of 1A2 because it can really boost their levels because fluoxetine blocks or inhibits CYP1A2. Caffeine is a very, you know, very common OTC example. Fluoxetine might end up giving you palpitations if you drink coffee with it. So I've seen the graphs. It's very like from serum levels like whoosh, with fluvoxamine. So like, yeah, be mindful of that. Be mindful of that. These seemingly simple OTC reactions might make your experiences a bit more unpleasant kasi. The poxetine is kind of trivial lang. It's something we have in the Philippines, but um, it's used for premature ejaculation. Mainly, it's, it's kind of weaponizing, repurposing the sexual dysfunction side effect as some for people who ejaculate early. For instance, you would, and they want to delay that ejaculation, well, let's use the sexual dysfunction effect of an SSRI, um, preferably something that works super short, for sexual activity. Yeah, and that's where the poxetine will come in. We have that. Um, so that's one other option, I guess. Fluvoxamine, by the way, to clarify, it does work for depression, but its main use has been for OCD. Yeah, but met meta-analysis Cipriani et al. shows it does work for depression then. But it's not gonna be your go-to. So just a summary of the um, properties, the MOA, differences in side effects. By the way, again, so CYP, 
So for interactions, citalopram, you would expect interactions with proton pop inhibitors because of the it is metabolized by 2C19 and proton pop inhibitors have 2C19 stuff going on. Whereas fluoxetine is the one that causes the interactions because it just inhibits a lot of things. So be mindful talaga. If you see fluoxetine, check interactions. Always check interactions with fluoxetine. And again, half-life, fluoxetine has a longer half-life, so perhaps less likely for withdrawal risk. But still possible. Still possible. Storage information is here because apparently there are health professionals that believe that ooh, psych meds, they all need to be refrigerated. They're special drugs. No. Okay? Most overwhelming majority of psych meds just have controlled room temperature as a storage requirement. So that was a big concern actually in implementing the MH gap or the medicine access program trainings in uh, there was a region that they were piloting this in and a lot of healthcare professionals had questions on storage so i put this here mainly to remind everyone that if it's not a parenteral more often than not it will not have special storage requirements nothing different from these standards some will not protect from light but many of these are just controlled room temperature okay paroxetine don't forget anticholinergic don't forget, um, potent 2D6 inhibition. Don't forget, super short half-life. So just, so, you know, usually I see paroxetine as an option that will be given if for those with, like, PTSD, because it's effective there. But there are also other SSRIs that are less problematic that you could give for PTSD. Say, sertraline, for instance. So, you know, you know. Plus, the M1 antagonism, theoretically, that can cause, that can lead to cognitive impairment. Not very helpful if you're undergoing psychotherapy, you know, you want to remember things that you learn in therapy and all that. That's a theoretical thing, of course, completely theoretical, not brought up in books. That's completely my hypothesis, but there are more tolerable meds out there, so just, yeah. But if it works for you, you know, good, right? But it wouldn't be my to go to. Flavoxamine, again, don't forget, very potent 1A2 inhibition. It can boost the levels of 1A2 substrates, like so be mindful of that. One of the two generally sedating, so paroxetine, flavoxamine, generally more sedating than usual. 